we cannot overemphasize the importance of water baptism because simply stated, baptism is for the remission of sins. And remission means to wash clean. I'm going to read three passages of Scripture, Hebrews 9.22, Acts 2.38, and Acts 22.16. A portion of Hebrews 9.22 says that without the shedding of blood or the spilling of blood or death, which causes blood to, to fall, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or washing away of sins. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now notice he connects baptism to the remission of sins. If you look also in Acts 22.16, Ananias, a disciple, he's in Damascus, and he goes to talk to this man Saul, this persecutor of Christians. And the Lord tells him when you go there, he's going to be healed and I'm going to show him the great things that I'm going to work through him. And God spends some time talking to Ananias. When Ananias gets there, Acts 22, 16, he's already been healed. He's already been touched by God and talked to by God. And Ananias looks at this Saul who would become Paul, the great apostle. And he would tell him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So if you notice, just like Acts 2.38, you see baptism, the washing away of sins in the name of the Lord being called. So baptism in the name of Jesus will always wash away your sins. Therefore, when you look at all of these examples and all the things that the Bible teaches us, water baptism is not just an outward sign of what's already happened on the inside as a result of our faith, but water baptism is where the blood of Jesus is applied to our spiritual man. And water baptism is where our sins are all washed away. And so now we can truly understand why Peter commanded the Gentiles to be water baptized. Because he wanted them to fulfill the water part of the new birth. Even though they had already received the gift of the Holy Spirit and fulfilled the spirit part. Let me ask a question. What will happen to a baby if while it is being born... The mother stops pushing, and the baby's halfway in and halfway out of the womb at the same time. The baby dies. Fortunately, the baby will die. And from this example, since we're talking about what Jesus said to enter the kingdom and the sea, which is to be born again, we must understand that a person needs to be water baptized and filled with the Spirit as well. Therefore, a person should be immediately water baptized after they express their faith in Jesus. If you've already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why wait? Why stop? Why stop there? Step completely into the kingdom of God in faith. Be baptized in Jesus' name and wash away all of your sins. Let's talk about another great reason to be water baptized. In Matthew 3, 13 and 16, Jesus was baptized. And since he was, how much more do we need to be water baptized. Then Jesus came to Galilee, reading verse 13 to 16. He came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and, and you're coming to me. Verse 15, but Jesus answered and said to him, per permit it to be so now, for thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Notice there was enough water there. He came completely out. Now, in this, we understand that sinless Jesus is our example. And he said to John the Baptist that baptism fulfills all righteousness. God in flesh is saying this. So if baptism fulfilled all righteousness for sinless Jesus, God manifested in the flesh, the image of God, how much more important it is for us to also be baptized as sinful humans. Therefore, being baptized is the only way to fulfill all righteousness, which means right doing. We want to do what's right. We want to be water baptized. So, who can be baptized? Well, first, someone wanting to be baptized must understand the reason for baptism. So they must be taught. They must have faith, and they must have repented. Matthew 28, 19 shows baptism follows teaching.
Mark 16, 16 reveals that a person must believe, and Acts 2, 38 tells us that they must first repent. And so, that is when, that is how. That is the person who can be baptized. Is it necessary for a baby, an infant, to be baptized? Well, we already described what a person must do first to be baptized. Each person who's baptized must first hear and understand the gospel. They must believe the gospel and then repent before being baptized. Can, can an infant do that? Actually, an infant doesn't have the ability to do any of these. Sincere people baptize their infants, not understanding that in the Bible, infant baptism is never found. So if a person has been baptized as a baby or an infant, what should they do now? They should be rebaptized in Jesus' name because that's, that's biblical. Now they understand. So when should I, when should we be baptized? Well, as soon as a person hears and responds to the message of salvation, he or she should be instantly baptized. Nine times in the book of Acts, people were baptized as soon as they believed and repented. That's very good evidence not to wait. So what is the proper method? What is the proper name we have to be baptized in according to the Bible? Let's look in the scripture. Matthew 28, 19 states, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38 states, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So notice in Matthew 28.19 and Acts 2.38, it says singular name. So there is a name that we must be baptized in. Now to understand these passages, we must understand there's no contradiction, even though it seems in Matthew 28.19 and Acts 2.38, there's a little variance there. We, we, we must understand that these, these passages are divinely inspired by God, which means that these are not two different messages on what to see over a person in baptism. We, we have to choose which one and we don't know. But these two passages of Scripture are actually saying the same thing because God's Word never contradicts. Also, as a side note, both books were written by men, divinely inspired of God, who no doubt knew each other, or knew about each other. Both books were accepted by early Christians as divinely inspired, and the church, most importantly in the New Testament, never argued over which one of these formulas or sayings to say in baptism. So let's go back to these two passages again. Matthew 28, 19, Acts 2, 38. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38 states, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice that each passage says name. That's singular. Name. One name. Not plural. Names. Many names. Just one name. So the question is, when you look at Scripture, did the apostles know and understand the name? Yes. What name did the apostles say in baptism? Look at Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Acts 19.5, Acts 22.16, and the references throughout the epistles. Always baptism was done in Jesus' name. Every time people were baptized in the Bible, only the name of Jesus was used. So is it important whether or not someone says Jesus or says the titles Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over you in baptism? Yes, it is. Let's consider this. Did the apostles use the name of Jesus or did they use the name or titles, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? They always just use the name. Let's consider this. If your boss handed you a paycheck and it didn't have your name on it, but it said, to a son, father, and husband, could you cash it? No. Why? Because the check must have your name on it. Because legal transactions can only take place using your name. Try getting a marriage license or signing a housing contract, or a work contract, or getting your inheritance from your parents' last will and testament without using your name. Impossible, because authority is only found in a name. For all contracts to be legal, your name must be used. You need a name. Question. 
Did the apostles use the name of Jesus or the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? They always use the name Jesus. Why? We're going to answer that in just a few moments.